Hello everybody, it's been a while. I did some major rework and I did even more procrastination. My rework mainly was about implementing a menu system. Now I have a title screen, option screen, game screen and so on. And they all look really ugly and improvised. I recently watched Prismatica Dev and he said the following. I think it's really important to decide on a style early on because that can drive the tone of the game and the tone of the game can drive the mechanics of the game as well. His statement isn't surprising as he is an artist after all. My current art style is called Doodles and the main effect I want to achieve is that it is replaced at some point when I have more things in place. I will click through the menu and you can judge it for yourself. Pretty, right? But anyways, what did I do? There are obviously different ways you can go at it if you want to create a menu such as this. One possibility is to use state machines. This one is the most simple representation of a state machine. The dot to the left shows where the state machine starts. The boxes are the states. Within those boxes is described what the output is doing. And the arrows are labeled with what causes the states to switch. For example, if you are in the off state, the start button needs to be pressed. If you want to see how to implement that in code, I made an example. For this code I use Java since the way Python is doing it is not what I'm used to. Which case means that you have a variable which can have different values attributed to it. In our case the variable state can be filled with a string. If the string is called state underscore off then it goes into the first case and does whatever is written there until it stumbles upon a break. Everything in the switch case after the break gets skipped. So at first it sets the output to false. Then it checks if the start button is true. If it is true, then it changes the value in the state variable to the string state underscore on. After that, it sees the break and leaves the switch case. The next time it goes into the switch case, the value of the variable state is state underscore on. So it enters and works through that case. If the variable gets a value which isn't covered by any case, then it goes into the default case at the end. This is a working state machine which probably is enough for most of your uses, but there is still stuff to be improved. In my microcontroller course at university I've learned about more and melee state machines. They are better defined in how they are implemented. For any beginner in stuff like this, go with more. The melee state machine has a quicker reaction time but it is less predictable and it is a bit more difficult to understand. Besides the state machines there are other options as well. If you want to appear smart, you can go look up and use software design patterns. There are various different design patterns and you can do loads of stuff with them. They are great. They just need a bit of time to get into. And I'm not making this game to learn something, so I ditched those and made my own version of it. My version basically builds on a stack. The first time I've heard about stacks is in the very same microcontroller lesson from before. Have you ever wondered how a function knows where to go back to after the function ends? You guessed it. They use a stack for that. Let's explain how stacks work with a simple example. This code starts with entering the main function at the memory address 0000. The stack on the right of the screen is empty. In the next clock cycle the software creates the variable text and fills it with a string with the content of tick. After the next clock cycle, the software enters a while loop. The condition for staying in there is always true. On the next line of code, the function game loop is called. Before the code jumps to that function, the current address of 0003 is written to the top of the stack. After that, the software jumps to the function game loop. Then it copies the string do stuff into the variable text and after that it prints the content of the variable text. Since line 0007 is the last line of the game loop function, it wants to jump back to where it left the previous function. And that address can be found in the uppermost entry of the stack. After it jumps back to the address 0003, the uppermost entry is deleted again. Then the software prints out the variable containing the string tick. Here we reach the end of the while loop. If we reach the end of the while loop, we jump back to the beginning and look at the condition again. The condition is still true and therefore we enter the loop again. But I will stop here now. I have just shown here is a very simplified representation of how a stack works. 
For example, real stacks also store other stuff like local variables to free the register memory. But this low level stuff is so strongly optimized that I don't know most of it myself. The amount of functions you can jump into is only limited by the stack size. With that knowledge in mind, many pages also behave pretty similar. The game always starts in the menu page. By selecting play, it switches to the play page. When I load the game, my software switches to the loading screen page. And after the loading screen is done, it switches to the game page. Whenever you see a back button or a discard button, it just goes back a page and removes it from the page stack. I didn't work with pointers and memory addresses with this stack of mine. I gave every menu page an ID, and then I just append or remove the ID number in a list. That works already very nicely, but there is still one function I needed to add to finish my game menu. When I am in the game, then I have a main menu button. And if we just leave the implementation as is, then the main menu is appended to that list. And since the main menu doesn't have a back button, the list can't get smaller again. This is not a huge problem since the memory I use here is barely anything. But if I can fix it, I fix it. Let's go back to the game page. When I press the menu button, I want to delete the entire stack and only have the main menu in there. So I just added that specific functionality to my code. I implemented that by just deleting the entire stack and filling it again with a single entry of the ID of the main menu. Now that you've seen how the menu system works, I can proceed in explaining what those pages actually are. A page is something I created myself, so no hidden libraries or whatever. It is a class which contains stuff like a background image, buttons, a map or even music. And not only the page is a class, the buttons are also a class, and the map, and the objects in the map, and the players, and so on. But let's start with the page. I think the best way is to start with loading pages. My goal is for the code to be somewhat flexible. And because of that, I don't want to hard code everything. So I made a general page class, and to that class I can add all objects in that class. Let's take the menu page for example. I have a background image, and I have five different buttons. Let's see how I implemented it in the code. On the first line I append a page to the list called pages. With that list I create a new object in the class page. When I created the new object I have to give it the name of that object and the size of it. The name is in my case just the ID number and the size is the size of the window. When we enter the page class, we can find there an init function. The selected line takes the name of the page and loads the respective image with it. That will be used as the background image. There are other variables in the init functions, but they are not important for us now. I switch back to the loading of the page. One line is repeated five times with only small changes in between them. With the pages square bracket open, zero square bracket closed, dot add underscore button, I say that I want to add a button to the newly created object. The first two numbers say where that button should be and the next two say how big that button should be. After that I write down what kind of text it should contain and in the end I have the ID of where the button points towards. As you already know, the menu page has the ID of zero, the play page has the ID of 1, the option page has the ID of 2, and so on. But what precisely happens in the page class with these buttons? As you can see, I show both the init function and the add underscore button function. In the init function, I have an empty list called self.buttons. And whenever the add underscore button function is called, I add to that list one new button. The process is exactly the same as before when I added a new page object to the page list. Now it is just a button object to the button list. In case you are curious, this is how the current button class looks like. If you want to, you can pause the video and look at it a bit closer. If you have any questions about it, feel free to ask them in the comment section. Currently, most pages only have buttons, but there are two pages which are an exception, the arena page and the game page. The arena page doesn't have any interesting functionality to it, so I will skip it. This is the loading of the game page. The beginning is the same, initializing the page and adding the buttons. But then there is this nested for loop and the add underscore map in the center of it. As you can imagine, since this is a loop with an add underscore map in it, it will add several maps to the page. 
To explain that, I need to take a step back. As I already told in the first devlog, this game is inspired by Arcus. That game has a map layout which is set up something like this. In the image there are two regions, in one region there are two maps and in the other there are three maps. Let's go back to the code. You can see here that I have a variable called maps and I put into that map a 2 and a 3. This means I have one region with two maps in it and the second one with three maps in it. I can freely extend that variable if I want to. But let's stay with it as it currently is. In the nested for loop I first go through the first region and add all maps and then I go to the second region and create all maps there. Since I only have two regions I stop after the second region. When creating such a map I have to give it the information on the position, on the size and I also have to give it a name. The very first map name in this nested loop is called map minus one minus one. The second one is called map minus one minus two and so on. The name of those maps contain the position of which region it belongs to and where it is in that region. With that information the page can decode which map it has to load in each cycle. One difference between the map and the button is that all the buttons are shown simultaneously on the page while only one map at a time is shown on the page. Currently I made it that when I press the number key I can switch between two different maps. The next thing I will add are the teleportation points because then the changing of the maps is actually useful. That is already everything I added to the game. The way the map currently works is mostly the same as in the previous version. There are some changes to it but I will leave it at that for now. That is it for today's video. I first wanted to create a teleporter before creating this video but I thought I'd better make a video now and the teleportation can go into the next video. I've made you wait long enough. See you next time and I hopefully don't get distracted too much by random YouTube videos and other aspects of life. Bye.